Doctors, what was the worst thing you've seen for a patient that another doctor overlooked? Probably the worst story one can hear. My wife found a lump under her breast that was really concerning. It took her about two months to get a proper appointment to have it looked at. Doc diagnosed it as a cyst and a fibriodenoma. She drained the lump and it was fine. Grew back a week later and it was bigger. Finally, after being in pain for weeks on end, the doctor said this is clearly not working, so we will do surgery and remove it. Upon going in for the checkup, thinking they'd take a look at the scar and healing, it turns out she had stage 2 triple negative breast cancer. The surgeon was absolutely floored. The most upsetting thing was that while her main surgeon and gyno, who was fantastic, was on holiday, another male doctor told her, quote, any surgery would be merely cosmetic and it clearly didn't bother her because he could touch the lump. I almost laid that doctor out in the office. When she got the diagnosis, he apologized to both of us for being a jerk. Unfortunately, this story doesn't end well. Despite doing eight months of therapy, chemo, and radio, her cancer returned seven months later and ultimately led to her demise after it spread to her brain and spinal fluid. So many people told me, ah, breast cancer, that's one of the easy ones. My insert relative nobody freaking cares about here had it. She switched gynos twice because they wouldn't take it seriously. It's been six months now and not a day goes by where I wish I could have taken her cancer away. She was freaking 27 years old. To anyone facing a cancer diagnosis or even a triple negative diagnosis, do not be deterred by the story. It is not your story. Keep fighting it. Live for yourself or my wife. To hell with cancer. To everyone wondering how I am doing, it's been six months since she passed. Though I have been grieving for a while longer, anticipatory grief they call it, and so, considering everything, I'm doing well. It was her birthday on February 28th, and she would have been 28, so the week was quite solemn. But other than that, I've found ways to move forward with her, not from her. Whenever I have a moment, I let it happen and then continue. I do have PTSD from her time in the hospital, but I am learning to deal with it, and I will go to therapy. All in all, I am doing well, enjoying life, and just processing all my feelings. I miss her every day, and will for the rest of my life. I've had a few people tell me to sue the doctor, especially considering the cost of treatment, etc. I live in Berlin, Germany, and despite that unfortunate initial diagnosis, her treatment and care have been a breeze afterwards. She received care from the Charité, Berlin, one of the finest medical institutions in the world and because of our healthcare system. We haven't paid a dime for any of her treatment. It's been a while and I am at peace with it all. I'm not going to go down the litigation path and sue a doctor for something that happened a few years ago in 2019. Though I do understand your concerns. Thank you all. I'm sorry for your loss. It's unfair and horrible and I hope you heal in due time. Story 2. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm frequently angered by the lack of care that our patients receive from some other doctors. Emergency rooms can be the worst about this when they're trying to shuffle patients through to psych admits as quickly as possible, sometimes neglecting other basic aspects of care in the process. Not every ED doctor is guilty of this by any means, and some are remarkably good about providing appropriate care for this population, but it happens far too often. Probably the most egregious incident occurred a couple of years ago while I was on overnight call at a VA hospital. So it started with a relatively routine call asking to transfer a patient to our psychiatric unit from a community hospital emergency department for treatment of psychosis. He was an older guy, I want to say early 70s, who had come in acting strange and delusional. His son-in-law had told the ED staff that he had received care with use for psychiatric issues before. I asked them to fax the transfer packet, a bundle of the assessments already performed there, and I started looking at his chart in the meantime. However, what I found was that he had not actually been admitted to our psychiatric unit. He had been seen by our psychiatry consults team for delirium while he was admitted to the medical floor for decompensated heart failure. For anyone unfamiliar, delirium can occur with any severe illness, where your brain basically isn't functioning properly due to the psychological stress your body is under. Sometimes it just manifests as confusion or disorientation, but sometimes it can get more dramatic with delusions and hallucinations. From what I saw in his chart, he had no actual primary psychiatric issues and had only been seen by the consult psychiatrist while he was delirious. So I get the transfer packet for this guy and not only has there been no cardiac workup for this guy who has a known history of heart failure, there aren't even vital signs on him. The only labs are a CBC, pretty unremarkable, and electrolytes and kidney markers. 
These chemistries are also not too abnormal, but I noticed that his urea nitrogen is a little elevated. This is generally a sign of poor perfusion through the kidneys as reabsorbing this urea also helps the kidneys reabsorb every last bit of water they can when the body is dehydrated. However, dehydration and low blood volume is only one possible reason why the kidneys might see reduced perfusion. Another possible reason would be if some had uncontrolled heart failure. So I call the outside emergency room and tell them that I will not accept this patient onto our psychiatric floor without at least a basic cardiac workup. I tell them his history, that he has only had psychiatric symptoms in the context of delirium from heart failure, and that the little bit of data they actually sent me points to that again recurring. They tell me, okay, they will get the labs and vitals that I requested and reach back out to me. I didn't hear back from them after this, and I assumed that they had found evidence of cardiovascular decompensation. I reached out to the medicine floor to transfer him there instead. So I'm going about my night and a couple hours later I get a call to come evaluate someone in the ED. I'm down there and using one of the computers at their desk when I hear one of the ED doctors mention something about a patient coming into medicine from the same hospital. For anyone unfamiliar, transfers to the VA pass through the ED first, despite this literally being illegal to do in other hospitals. I don't understand the reasoning behind it, but it's what they do. Curious, I ask if it's a guy coming in with decompensated heart failure. I am informed that not only is it the same guy who will probably be getting a psych consult for delirium, but that he had actively been having a freaking heart attack in their ED. Needless to say, I was pretty upset that this outside ED had tried to send this guy to our psych unit where it is a lot harder to get other medical treatments without even getting vital signs on him or realizing that he was having a heart attack. I tell this story to medical students who are rotating through psychiatry all the time to try to hammer home the point that just because someone is acting bizarre doesn't mean that you can just throw the quote-unquote psych patient label on them and ignore everything else. Story 3. I'm the patient in the story. When I was a toddler and started walking, my extended family noticed that I would waddle a lot. My parents didn't really notice it because they grew used to my funny walking. But my grandma and my aunts that saw me so much less often insisted that I had a limp. So my mother asked our pediatrician about it and he reassured that it was nothing and that it would fix itself while I was growing up. But one year it passed and it didn't fix itself. It got more noticeable actually. My mother asked again to my doctor. She asked for an x-ray to make sure everything was fine. And the doctor yelled at her for wanting to expose me to the rays. He insisted, he really insisted it was nothing but referred us to a specialist anyway. The specialist suggested that my parents put some wool around my leg that had the limp because wool would warm it up and speed up the growing process. Right. My dad finally had enough. It was summer and my regular pediatrician was on holiday. His partner visited me because meanwhile the limping became really bad and my parents wanted another opinion. The new doc measured my legs. There was like a four or five centimeter difference between the two legs. They sent me to a specialist children's hospital to get it fixed right away. I had severe dysplasia. It was so, so severe. Three years and three surgeries later, months of physiotherapy to learn to walk again, and I was normal. If the second doc didn't catch it, I would have grown up disabled. He split up with his work partner, the first doctor. Second doc is now my daughter's pediatrician. Yikes! Exposed to x-rays that you will no doubt be exposed to at literally any point in your life anyway? What kind of reason is that to even yell at someone? Sounds like a total jerk to me. I'm glad someone caught the issue and it was sorted out while this person was young. Story 4. Rattlesnake bite on a kid. Patient and dad out in the fields near a small town that is several hours away from the nearest big city where I work. Dad takes the child to the ER in the small town with an obvious snake bite. The doctor there says, "Ah, it's okay, she probably didn't get envenomated. Doesn't give the patient antivenin, which they had at that hospital. And instead of electing to send the child to us by helicopter, he sent her by ambulance. Several hours later, the patient showed up to our hospital coding and ended up passing away. Probably didn't get envenomated? Like, what kind of stupid idea is that? If a tiny child gets bitten by a rattlesnake, you assume they've been envenomated and you treat them as though that had been. That means antivenin, psychological support, etc. Completely absurd. Story 5. 
Not a doctor, but when I was 16, I was studying to be a nurse and I got sent on a shadowing slash work experience to a nursing home. The worst thing I've seen overlooked is loneliness. There was a resident, I'll call him Mr. R. I had a little free time on my second day, so I went exploring to try and learn the lay of the land. On my walk, I glance into one of the rooms which had their door open and see this resident inside coughing and hawking up phlegm on his own shirt because he had nothing else to cough into. I run and get him a box of tissues. While he's wiping himself down, I sit opposite of him, waiting in case he needs anything else from me. He sees I'm new, he thanked me for the tissues, and we began talking about the pictures in his room. He told me his life story, about his time in the army, how he met his wife, about how he missed traveling to Sweden every year, all the dogs he'd had had throughout his life. He was the first person to talk to me in a friendly manner at the placement, and I really enjoyed chatting with him. He was funny, smart, and overall just a nice person. He had lived a long and interesting life, and since he had no children, it had been a while since he had spoken to a teenager. After about 20 minutes, a member of staff knocked on the door and told me I was needed. I said goodbye to Mr. R and promised to visit him again during my stay. I thanked him for making me feel so welcome, and he thanked me and began to cry. He said no one had ever done that for him. Mr. R had been at the home for three years. In all that time, no one had just sat down and talked to him, asked him questions, and genuinely listened to him, made him laugh, and made him feel heard. I ended up making several formal complaints and inquiries about multiple problems I witnessed and encountered, manhandling, neglect, unclean environments, belittling language towards residents, and a general lack of care were just a few. It was the first time I had ever been both so heartbroken and so angry. As a caregiver, one of the fundamentals is that you have to care. And for one reason or another, these staff had forgotten. There were a lot of things I saw at that placement that I will remember for the rest of my life, but the hanging feeling of isolation was the worst. Aw man, this one got me, and I don't know how so many people who are disinterested in giving care end up in a career where the whole point is to give a damn about people. I bet this person grew up to be a really good nurse since he or she sounds like Florence freaking Nightingale in their last life. Such a kind soul. Anyway, since you're already here, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more heartwarming stories just like this one. And now moving on to the next story. Story 6. Ooh, I got a good one, albeit sad. I was working nights and a patient came in for a nail bed repair under general anesthesia. It was a slow night. As they're anesthetizing him, he aspirates, so we do a chest x-ray to see if he's got anything in his lungs. What we didn't know is that prior to this emergency surgery, he'd been going to his GP for over six months, complaining about chest tightness. They'd put him on various different asthma medications, but none had any effect on him. The x-ray showed a massive dark mass in his left lung. We kept him asleep and transferred him to the ICU. His wife and three-year-old daughter were waiting for him on the ward. We had to tell them where he'd gone, why he'd gone there, and what was going to happen. He passed away from lung cancer within the month. A general anesthetic is absolutely ridiculous for a nail bed repair, but he refused to have it done under local conditions. This man was in his late 20s, a non-smoker, and I couldn't move past the situation for months after it. Story 7. I'm the patient, but it's an important story to tell. From the age of about 17, I started getting regular abdominal pain every day and terrible gut problems. I can't seem to eat much anymore. I get fluctuating trots and constipation. Menstruation gets more and more painful. I start losing enormous amounts despite being incredibly small, less than 5 feet. Now you would think any doctor worth her salt could figure out it's a gynecological problem. But my doctor, a woman by the way, at the time insisted it was anxiety and said she wouldn't bother testing for or treating a gynecological problem unless I was older and having trouble conceiving. Over the next few years, my gut and uterus symptoms slowly deteriorate. I get bounced around the system to dozens of different specialists. I get told it's just stress, anxiety, are you pregnant? Are you sure you're not pregnant? Every woman has painful periods. It's just constipation. Take this over-the-counter product, etc., etc. Meanwhile, my gut function slowly grinds to a halt. A functional gut test took six hours to pass an egg sandwich when it should have taken 90 minutes. I weighed only 40 kilograms. It gets so bad, I even start losing bowel control. No treatment seems to work. I was 24 and unable to work because I was literally uncontrollably crapping my pants. Doctors suggest I should maybe seek therapy and suggest I could be exaggerating. 
Anyway, one day I see a new GP for some regular health tests, but get an abnormal pap smear. Within two weeks, I went in for an exploratory laparoscopy to rule out cervical cancer, only to discover I am absolutely riddled with endometriosis. On my bowel, on my cervix, on my perineum, on some ligaments, ovarian cysts the size of a tennis ball. It was even in my gallbladder. With excisions plus treatment, I had my gut function back within three months, though I'll never be able to have children. If that woman, when I was 17, had just done her damn job, I wouldn't have lost seven years of my life, my gallbladder, my fertility, and my mental health. Ah, this sounds so exhausting and devastating for her. I'm finally glad she was able to get the proper treatment, but damn, so unacceptable that it came so late. Story 8. I'm not a doctor, but an RN. This happened to me, but it isn't nearly as bad as most of the stories on here. When I was in college, I got to where I couldn't swallow. It started with difficulty swallowing, progressed to me having to swallow bites of food multiple times or regurgitating it, and then got to where all I could swallow was broths and mashed potatoes with no chunks. I went to the doctor multiple times and was told every time it was acid reflux and part of my anxiety disorder. I lost 30 pounds, was only 120 when this started, and was just generally miserable. Finally, my grandma was tired of watching me be sick all the time, so she called the GI doctor herself. They said we needed a referral, but she explained the situation and they got me in the next day. Did an endoscopy and my esophagus was 95% occluded at the gastroesophageal sphincter. For some reason, some of my primary doctor's notes ended up in my discharge paperwork. I guess they had to contact her to get my information. And she had told them it was acid reflux and basically I was being overdramatic. She stated she did not recommend them to do the procedure. Needless to say, I switched doctors. F that which was not a fun year at all. Story 9. Here's my story. A guy came into our ICU and was very septic but still talking. He had visited his primary care MD with complaints of a sore throat for a couple of days. Dismissed without any intervention since he didn't appear to have strep throat or the flu. At this point, he was having pretty severe abdominal discomfort, so we sent him for a CT scan. As the scan was finishing, he coded and had to be intubated, multi-organ failure, etc. The CT scan was horrible. He had all kinds of crap all over his peritoneal cavity. His wife told us that he had choked on an ice cube the day before he saw his primary care MD. Evidently, he swallowed a whole double half-moon-shaped ice cube that perforated his esophagus with a huge linear 4.25-inch tear, allowing a significant portion of his swallowed food and drinks to get into his peritoneal cavity instead of his stomach. To make things worse, he had some reflux that allowed stomach acid to get in there as well, likely while he was sleeping. Once we realized what was going on, he went for extensive washout and exploratory surgeries to repair the damage to his esophagus and other organs. Thankfully, he made a full recovery, but he was very close to not making it. Okay, great. Now I need to be scared of eating ice? Story 10. In my psychiatry residency, I was working in the psych ER one night when we got a transfer from the main ER. Her family had brought her in for altered mental status that had been getting gradually worse over the past two weeks. She had been cleared by the ER doctors, all labs and vitals had been normal, and I was told she was likely having a mental breakdown or psychotic episode. She was rolled into our area and I went to assess her. She was non-responsive, staring off into space, crying and shaking her head back and forth and mumbling. She could not answer any questions and seemed to be having a tremendous amount of anxiety. As a psychiatrist, one of the biggest lessons my mentors taught us was to assume a change in mental status is always a medical condition until proven otherwise, and then you can think about psychiatric causes. Within a couple of seconds of me seeing her, I had a gut feeling this was not psychiatric in nature. I looked through her chart and saw she had a history of clots in the past. Her vitals were rechecked and again, they were totally normal. At that point, I made an executive decision and ordered a stat CT of her chest looking for a possible clot. The technicians who came to take her for the study were slightly confused as to why a psych resident was ordering this, and the radiology team even called me and wanted to make sure I had not ordered it by mistake. 30 minutes later, I get a call from the on-call radiology resident, and she says, Are you the psych resident that ordered this CT? Yep, that's me. Thinking I was about to get some comments about wasting their time, she continued, And this patient is in the psych ER? Yes. 
well, you better call the ER and have her transferred stat because this lady has the most massive pulmonary embolism I have ever seen and will likely code any second. So with that, we transferred her back to the ER. She was admitted to the hospital and treated for her clot. Within a few days, she was back to normal. From then on, whenever someone would make a joke about a psychiatrist not being real doctors, I would tell them this story and that would settle it. Well, if you like these stories and if you learned a good lesson or two, here's more. YouTube thinks you're going to love this. I'll catch you in that video and thank you very much for hanging out with me on this one.